Welcome to the Text Alliance of Energy Producers Spotlight on the Issues webinar series. I'm your host, Jason Modulin, the president of the Alliance. It's my honor to be with you today. The Texas Alliance of Energy Producers represents over 2,600 individuals and member companies that are focused on advancing independent operators and the standards of the Texas oil and gas industry. Through advocacy for smart energy and environmental policy, effective communications, and cost-saving insurance programs, the Alliance delivers for our members. I want to thank Noble Royalties for being our title sponsor today. As a leader in minerals and royalties since 1997, Noble remains committed to creative solutions for others who may be rethinking their risk tolerance. Now might be a good time to reset, rethink, and redeploy capital differently to adjust to this current market cycle. If so, we ask that you consider giving Noble Royalties a call to see if there's a solution to benefit your family or company. This year, the Alliance is celebrating our 90th anniversary. Founded in 1930 in Wichita Falls as the North Texas Oil and Gas Association, we merged with the West Central Texas Oil and Gas Association from Abilene in 2000 and expanded our focus statewide, adding members from across the state. While we celebrate our past, we are firmly focused on the future, delivering solutions for Texas independent operators. Thank you very much to our board members who are joining today. I saw Alan Frizzell and Jim Tremuto and a few others coming in now. Thank you for being here. Please mark your calendars for our next webinar with Railroad Commissioner Wayne Christian on December 3rd at 10 a.m. Registration links will be coming out soon. Normally this time would be where I would hand it over to our chairman, Cy Wagner, but unfortunately she was unable to be here today with a conflict. I look forward to introducing her to our guest, Comptroller Glenn Hager in the near future. Comptroller Hager, Glenn Hager was elected as the 36th Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts in November, 2014. He's Texas's chief financial officer, the state's treasurer, check writer, tax collector, procurement officer, and revenue estimator. Upon taking office, he reorganized the agency for quicker and more effective decision-making and reduced its administrative footprint by working with the legislature to eliminate inefficient programs and transfer others that did not fit core missions. Additionally, the comptroller recommended that the legislature repeal eight taxes, six of which were administered by his agency. He is focused on his agency's constitutional duties and committed to improving his committed to improving the customer service and job creation and business expansion and thus a healthier Texas economy. As CFO for the world's ninth largest economy, Hager monitors Texas's financial health to ensure it maintains strong fund balances during his term in office. He has emerged as a passionate advocate for conservative financial management and fiscal transparency at all levels. If you would like to submit a question to Glenn, please utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen we will go till 2.30 and wrap up with a few audience questions. Glenn, welcome. Thank you for participating in the Spotlight on the Issues series. Set the stage for us. How is Texas doing relative to the nation and what has consumed you and your office lately? Yeah, thanks, Jason. Good to be with you. And thanks for what you do here in the state of Texas, especially in the oil and gas industry and all the job creation that has occurred here in the state. And needless to say, revenues into the great state of Texas. Uh, payroll. It's uh, amazing what y'all do. And I just want to say thank you for that from the start set. Let me, let me first kind of just back up kind of real quickly to, you know, where the state was in a position financially, what we saw occurred in the economy back in February of this year, which we all know was a very, very long time ago. You know, Texas in the month of February had gained about 50,000 jobs. We were uh, between that month and the prior 11 months, so 12 months total, we created over 300,000 jobs. And in short, that just meant Texas was right along where we normally had been, outpacing the national average in job creation as well as GDP growth. But then, of course, Texas got hit by the dual headwinds in the month of March. Your industry particularly hit uh, there at the very beginning with Russia and Saudi Arabia, not able to agree on OPEC cuts and the absolute worst time for Saudi Arabia to make an announcement that they were gonna increase production. That in itself uh, obviously caused a lot of concern for me and my staff that Texas was going to have some type of significant impact in the oil and gas industry, you know, much like we saw in 2015 and 16, 
the oil industry as well as the manufacturing industries took a significant hit at that time. So it was obviously concerning what kind of pressures that would put on the state of Texas overall economy. Just in that alone, we had been tracking COVID uh, like everybody else had. And then so quickly within a few weeks, my 3000 employees, we were going to fully telework. So many businesses were being shut down and I just felt like I needed to get out and unfortunately have to say that the 129 month record expansion of the US economy was gonna to come to an abrupt halt. You know, never did I want to ever use that word recession, but it was something that I felt like I needed to get out and announce that, you know, Texas, we didn't know what those, what that downturn would be, how long, how deep, how wide, but we knew there'd be an impact. And so my team started looking back at prior recessions, what happened to tax revenues, what was the length of the duration, uh, typically things we really look at for the $126 billion budget as we're monitoring, as you mentioned, the ninth largest economy in the world, 12 economic regions, obviously a lot of complexities, but three real important things are our tax collection, which is sales tax is the biggest number. Uh, those of you that may not know of the $126 billion budget, a third of it is federal dollars, two thirds is state dollars of the state dollar portion. Obviously the big piece is tax collection and all revenue streams are important, but sales tax is anywhere between 56 to 60% of all the taxes we collect in the state of Texas. So that's the reason I highlight that one more than any others, because that really can swing the health of the state budget so much more significantly than all the other streams, even though they're always, needless to say, all of them are important as you put the whole pie together. But if we look at sales tax collections, GDP numbers, as well as employment numbers, those data points lag. So my staff got out and started looking at what we call a lot of non-traditional economic indicators. We've seen a lot of them in the news since then. A lot of people are looking at some of the same things we have, just some data that you can get pretty, pretty easily and quickly. I never knew that we had roughly 2.3 million people fly in the United States on average in a given day. I had no clue about that. But every week when my team sends me an update on the uh, data points, whether it's how many people staying in hotels, how many people traveling around in automobiles in the state of Texas and or the different metropolitan areas, how many people are going to box offices, how many people are using open table to go to restaurants. There's a company that's published their data from a raw data sense of companies that they work with for part-time employees mm. and hourly employees. So we continually track that uh, to, to look at those data points for here in Texas. So there's a lot of these non-traditional data points um, just to go make a point from a consumption standpoint of, of fuel, you know, obviously people are traveling fewer hours, fewer miles in automobiles, but back to the airplanes, I mentioned it was 2.3 million people at the trough there in the first week of April when no one was traveling around. We went down to literally 90,000 people on average from 2.3 million. Now Labor Day weekend, we got up to around a million again. We're hovering somewhere around 750 to 800,000 people. And so my point is it's a drastic increase but it's nowhere near the 2.3 million that we were at is, is what I'm getting at. Now mm -hmm. revenues into the state treasury, we had went and provided a revised revenue estimate in July. I wanted a few months of tax collections, even though we're looking at the non-traditional points, you wanted a few months of tax collections to, to provide hopefully some reasonable uh, revision to the revenue estimate. We'd originally said that the current two year budget cycle, which we're under, you know, uh, uh, the current two year budget ends in August of 2021. And so therefore that two year budget cycle originally had a $3 billion surplus. In July, we'd revised that to a $4.6 billion deficit. Now that deficit in part has been closed by agencies. You know, I got out early and said, we're freezing hires in my shop. We're not doing pay increases, reevaluating IT projects. I can't yeah, tell other smart. agencies what to do, but I can script out that, hey folks, leadership's gonna tell you to do something and you better start early because it's easier to go shallow for long then wait, mm -hmm. wait, wait, and have to go deeper. And so all of those state agency savings is gonna be about a billion dollars. Now bear in mind, two thirds of the state budget is really off the table when it comes to budget reductions. And why is that? Because those two pieces are principally public education as well as health and human service budget or more specifically Medicaid, which is something that's an entitlement and we can't cut. And then during a time like this, you actually have Medicaid costs go up because more people go on the rolls. And so, so in short, that small portion of the budget that can be cut, touched is about a billion dollars in savings. 
that actually officially gets recognized when the legislature comes into session and recapture those savings, even though they're physically sitting in the treasury. And, and so that'll reduce that number. Also, revenues have come in slightly higher than we had anticipated. Now, I'll give you a couple of data points on online sales. Thankfully, the legislature passed two pieces of legislation that I asked them to pass last session because of a Wayfair decision by the US Supreme Court, which in essence meant a business didn't have to have a physical presence in the state for us to audit them and make sure they're complying with paying, collecting and paying sales tax. So all the online purchases, whether it's marketplace providers like Amazon or eBay, and there's a whole lot more than just those few. I mean, there's hundreds of them that are now registered right. with us and remote sellers. In other words, they, they will have their own website that they'll sell, sell into the state of Texas. Originally we'd estimated in a given year, that'd be a, about half a billion dollars to the state treasury. Well, thankfully to the upside, we were wrong. Actually, in the first 10 months, we collected over a billion dollars. And so uh, that's been a significant benefit to the state treasury. You know, and to me, I told the legislature, that's really about a fairness issue because your local brick and mortar store is collecting that sales tax. And there really needs to be a fairness that everybody's playing on an equal playing field. And so, you know, it's more about a fairness than a collection issue. But that's also meant that as a result, local governments have also received about $280 million more in that first year in local sales tax collections as well. So that's obviously helped. We had originally anticipated that we'd see net sales tax decline for about a, about a year, uh, almost double digit numbers. In fact, it's not quite been as bad as we anticipated. Mm -hmm. It's still negative, but not as negative. And so that's obviously helped. And then obviously there's federal dollars that have come in different packages. Some of the largest portion is what's called the CARES money, that some of those dollars are specifically spent for COVID type expenses, but then some of those can also be utilized to offset expenses for certain salary employees. And so my point being is I feel like this current four and a half billion dollar deficit is gonna get down to a very, very manageable number and probably a negligible number for the legislature for next session. We're working on our, our new revenue estimate right now. Uh, it takes my, my team months and months of work because there's a lot of back data numbers that has to go into this. Um, it's not just a couple of numbers. So we're, we're working on that right now. I've been saying in most of my speeches, you know, 2020 is about flexibility and adaptability, not just in our own lives, but businesses and government, how we have to go about just to keep the economy and things going. But then also in that being said is I've also said, well, I just like a couple more months of data. I've been saying that same thing since yep. March and I'm staying with it just in part because we're not only trying to estimate what individual behavior is going to do in Texas, what business behavior is going to do in Texas. And again, the ninth largest economy in the world, what government behavior is going to be in a very uncertain world, but also what that individual business and government behavior is going to do in the rest of the world, you know, and I frequently cite that Texas is 19% of all the exports out of the United States. We are by far the leading export state in this nation in one part because of your industry. Significant number of products are going out of this state, whether, you know, years, a few years ago, finally the federal government lifted the, the export ban, but also the materials that go into downstream production, whether it's not just refinery, capacity that's sent out, but also whether it's in manufacturing. And so a significant number amount of petroleum products are exported out of the state. And actually the state of Texas in the last number of years has actually helped counterbalance the trade deficit that this country has had large part driven by your industry. And so that's I right. mentioned the fact that we're 19% of the exports out of the country to again highlight that we're very intertwined to the rest of the global economy. And so, you know, what happens over when Europe, whether it's Great Britain or Germany or, or Italy or France are talking about having, once again, going back into a shutdown to some degree, that has a supply chain issue here in the United States and in Texas. And so that's why, you know, every rest of revenue estimate is clouded with uncertainty. This one has more clouds of uncertainty than ever before. And so, you know, we're, we want to get it right, but we also know that things are fluid during this time. And so, you know, we're constantly trying to visit with leadership and update. But the bottom line, if you take from this, Texas was outpacing the national average before we entered the pandemic, which put us on a stronger footing than many other states. I was on calls with other treasurers in the very beginning and quickly realized, I'm glad I get to do my job in Texas 
and not somewhere else because of that strong foundation that we entered into. You know, Texas, we're an oil and gas state. We're one of a handful. And so therefore that double headwind, of the pandemic and the lower prices, which has impacted production too, uh, that impacts Texas. But, you know, things look better than we had anticipated. Again, we still think that it's going to take us until about the beginning of 2022 to get back to pre-pandemic levels just because the contraction was so deep and so hard from unemployment and GDP numbers. You know, so our numbers continually get a little better. We had about 3.4% unemployment before the pandemic, before the month of March. We moved all the way up to 13% and we're back down to about a little over 8%. So, you know, obviously better, but you have a significant number of people that are still unemployed and or on part-time employment and a lot of businesses that are obviously still struggling. And we've seen, and I'll make this point and then start uh, open it up for questions. It's amazing how during this last so many months of this year, you've seen a significant disruption in some businesses are suffering significantly. If they're in obviously certain oil and gas companies, if you have the hotel industry, leisure, hospitality, vacation areas, people didn't go on vacation. But if you're a company that focuses in around products around the home, it's a much better time for you. You know, if you're uh, if you're somebody that sells at a grocery store or a liquor store versus at a restaurant, it's obviously there's major disruptions is my point. Mm -hmm. And remember how I said, uh, you know, we've had negative sales tax numbers with the exception of the month of July, which is actually economic activity in June. You and I go and make purchases in June. Business is collected. They hold it in trust. The next month they start sending it to me, to the controller, to the controller's office. And so in the month of July, we actually had a positive sales tax month of about 4% higher than July of 2019. And why is that? It was principally centered around purchases in and around the homes. People in Texas in the months of May and June, economic activity, spent about $7.3 billion in and around their houses. And so instead of doing vacations, they were doing staycations. They were painting their house, doing yard work. And so, you know, it's a shift of significant disruption from one business sector to the other. But, you know, in, in long and short, I mean, we think next legislative session is obviously going to be a difficult session for the legislature. Um, however, I feel much more optimistic that it's not going to be as bad as originally we thought. The yeah, Texas economy has held up better. But then again, you know, just to make the point, uh, we, we just have a lot of uncertainty as we go through the winter months until we get back into the spring. And then hopefully, you know, we'll start seeing some relief from COVID, whether it's some of the, you know, pharmaceutical products that, that, that have been advertised as of recent. So uh, I feel better about where we're at. You know, Texas is, is on a better path than many other states, but obviously the legislature is still going to have a pretty difficult session next session because it's just not, let, let's just say the coffers are not going to be as full as they used to be, but right. this session is not going to be as bad as, and I went through it as a house member in 03, which was a rough session. As a Senator, I was there in 2011, which was just an absolute awful legislative session. Um, I feel much better that we're not gonna have a repeat of 2011, which, which you know, that in itself um, is, is welcome news for most of the members. So how about I stop there, Jason, and uh, why don't we open it up for questions or comments or whatever folks may have. It certainly is. Uh, uh, it seems to be better than in 2011, and I think in in part that's uh, some of the softening of the blow uh, uh, from your office to legislators to make sure that they're fully aware of the uh, of the circumstances and, and they're not caught off guard. Um, I, I want to thank you for inviting Carr Ingham, the Alliance's Petroleum Economist, to be part of your economic roundtable next week as you consider the state of the Texas oil and gas industry and, and how that impacts the budget. And, and before we get away from COVID, I, we had a great comment come in. Yeah. Are you seeing impacts to sales tax or other types of tax collections as we potentially head into winter and maybe another uh, uptick in COVID cases? Is, are, are you seeing that tracking or um, are, are we still kind of down yeah, across right, right now? Sales tax numbers, they're pretty much negative in most industry, most areas and sectors, with the exception of the one of online and in and around the house. And, and so really, you know, a lot of people ask me, which, which industry is going to lead us out of this? And of course, you know, whichever industry I'm talking to, I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's you, of course. Yeah, um, we're going but, to take it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I say that tongue in cheek. 
And the reason I, I, I joke about that in part is that, you know, really the point I focus on is us, the consumer, because we are a consumption economy. And so therefore, you know, it's really about instilling confidence in us, the consumer, to engage in economic activity. And, and one of the positives is that the area of, of, of some of that retail and centered around the home internet sales has continued to be positive. You know, I think the real big issue to answer that question is whether we as individuals and businesses, as well as the question of whether there'll be any more government mandated shutdowns, I think those can have an impact. And, and we've seen some research that it's not as much government mandated shutdowns that impacts people's behavior as it is out of fear and concern. And so, yep. you know, that's the reason I, I continually talk about anything that we all can do to do our part, to, to, to walk in the shoes of others or see how, you know, they, they anticipate and feel about it is, you know, whatever we can do just to, to, you know, help other people feel a little bit better about engaging the economy, I think is really critical. And so long as we continually responsibly talk about that, I'm not as concerned that we're gonna have a significant contraction compared to where we're on now. It seems like, you know, we're, we're on a pretty good path unless we just have some really awful months in, in the months ahead. But I know, you know, at least here in the state, the governor's office, Department of Emergency Management have tried to get in a position to be really prepared. And then if we do have flare ups, which we're going to have in certain regions, mm -hmm. you know, to try to deal with it. But as we were earlier the year in the Valley, as we have been in the last week or two in, in El Paso, as we also have had up in the Lubbock area and the governor sent some more resources up there. So, you know, as long as we're trying to deal with those very quickly, those kind of hotter spots, unfortunately, then that will help keep the spread down. And, and one of the last things I'll mention, really not to the question, but which I, th I find is really interesting. Now I've got three kids in the public school system, 15, 12 and 12, and, and all my kids, they, they wanted to go back. And, and talking with uh, Mike Morath, the Texas Education Commissioner, it's really interesting how the schools, they're not the super spreader that everybody, that some people thought they were going to be, yep. you know, but, but kids today, uh, my kids, I drop them off in the mornings when I can, and they got their mask on, they wash their hands. I mean, they're much more hygienic than they used to be, which kids are never that way. And, uh, you know, as long as people go about some basic things, it's really amazing how the environment, I mean, it's actually real, very safe for them. And hopefully we can keep it that way is my point, just because I think they do a lot better going in person than me teaching them at home. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. off the point, but just to make a point about, you know, if we all go about a little bit different, I think people and consumers can have greater confidence is all I'm saying. Right. Well, you, you rightly referenced the oil and gas and the record pace that we were setting <laughs> As, as late as March of this year, um, uh, uh, price and production uh, ha have rebounded quite a bit since that low point in April 20th. Um, but oil field activities kind of tracked in other ways and, and you tie a couple other taxes um, to that, that oil and gas uh, uh, activity, whether it's sales tax or, or potential property tax implications as we approach that January 1 date. Are, are you seeing, um, uh, some trends there or, or anything? Uh, early One of the things on. is as we're working on the revenue estimate, obviously severance tax collections have taken a significant impact. You know, originally we had anticipated that uh, we would be transferring this month from last fiscal year's economic activity of about $1.6 billion over to the state highway fund and the economic stabilization fund or rainy day fund savings account, thanks to your industry from severance tax. That, that number was really about one, it's going to be about $1.1 billion, so about half a billion dollars less to each because of the impacts that we had, you know, there was a little bit of softness, obviously, from whether companies getting refinancing with banks and or private equity already, but obviously March was a significant hit. And one of the things that I talked about, people always wanna ask me about price, but your industry knows better than everybody. It's not just about price, it's about volume of production. And this time the concern that production was going to decrease. We were gonna have that first time uh, a, a decrease in production, and that was gonna be an impact to both. Now, as we're working on our revenue estimate, it looks as though maybe for the upcoming transfers in the next few years, we had originally uh, had it about 1.4 billion. We'd estimated in July, it's only about 650 million for what we collect this fiscal year. It looks as though that number is gonna be a little bit better, which, which is obviously uh, positive news, you know, not going back to those, those high numbers we had, but, but having a little bit better activity, which is, which, is a good, which is a good sign, you know, rig counts, um, I mean, I know that's not at all, but a lot of our sales tax collections really tracks with rig counts. Mm -hmm. That's the first phase of, of, of production and that's where the sales tax numbers. So, you know, we've seen a, a slight uptick in rig counts, 
and, and obviously those trends help a little bit here in sales tax. But I think the biggest question is what's going to happen worldwide and, you know, getting people flying in airplanes and traveling in vehicles again. Yeah. Critical. I've flown a few times and I, I don't mind flying. It doesn't bother me whatsoever. And, you know, just trying to instill that confidence in people so they will get back to that activity will help us get there quicker in our opinion. Mm -hmm. Appraising minerals is always a contentious issue. And at the oil and gas seminar meeting, your office hosted this past August, there was some appetite by the appraisal firms to, to open up that statute a little bit. Can, can you share any insight there as to what your office would like to see if changes are proposed by the legislature? Yeah, if, if, if anything, if there's proposals, you know, and I know there's been a little appetite over the years where I've changed a few things of, of, of how that calculation comes into on January 1. And, you know, obviously this year when, when you have a, a price point put in and then literally everything drastically changed in 60 days. And so, you know, the industry is going, whoa, 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 we're, we're, we're not where we were on January 1 anymore. The world has fundamentally changed and we completely understand that, you know, unfortunately, our hands are kind of a little bit tied in, in the local appraisal districts from state statute. You know, there's nothing that we are saying that, hey, this is what we think you should do. I mean, I try to take a step back and, and let policymakers do their job, let industry, you know, advocate. The thing that we would ask is, is if there's going to be a change, simpler is always better. Uh, less complexity, you know, seems to work better as, as the appraisers are working in the appraisal districts to understand what the law is and make sure that there's uniformity from, from, from appraisal district to appraisal district, I think is always really critical. And so that's the reason I just have to default to, you know, trying to make it as simple as we can so they understand it. And as, as your members are, are in multiple counties, everything at least is an equal playing field and they understand what the rules are, I think is really critical. No, oh, that's helpful. You, you also made some very recent timely comments about fracking bans and that projection on the state. Yeah. Um, uh, and just wondered if you would kind of refresh those for, for uh, our members, uh, whether that proposal comes from, from Congress or the Texas legislature. Uh, well, first, first, it would be bad. You know, you know it. I know it. We all know it. Thankfully, most Texans know it, with the exception that may live in Travis County. Um, but at least the, the other 253 counties know it. Um, we, we ran several economic models. I had some members that asked me, is this something that you would look at? And, and we thought it was timely to refresh it. You know, our numbers are, are probably more conservative than, than what some of the numbers would be. But, uh, you know, I try to make sure that, that we provide very conservative, you know, estimates on any of the things. But I'll just run through a couple of them. You know, within four years, we'd have roughly about 70% reduction in oil production. We'd have about $150 billion in wages and income in those four years. GDP would decrease by at least a quarter of a billion dollars, $250 billion or more. Um, you would have employment decrease by over a million, uh, not just in the oil field, but indirect jobs as well. And then from a tax collection perspective, this upcoming biennium two-year budget uh, we'd see about a $6 billion impact. And, and, and within a few years, you could be getting up to $10 billion impact to the state treasury a year. I mean, that, I don't know about you. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe that, maybe that's not real money to you, Jason. It's big money. It's, it's real money to me. Okay. Real money. So, you know, those are some conservative numbers, but those are very significant impacts here in the state of Texas. Um, you know, I, I was given a, I was talking to somebody the other day on, on one of the radio interviews and I said, you know, yes, Biden administration or, you know, if, 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 if he can, if he actually wins and, and, you know, that's, that's what the electoral college is, um, which seems that way, the, the, you know, he has kind of walked back some of it and said, oh, well, mm -hmm. you know, public lands. Well, yeah, we don't have a lot of public lands, but the companies that do business here do business in our sister state in New Mexico right. with public lands. And so, yes, maybe it's not directly a Texas issue of the state, but the companies that are based here, it's an, it's an issue and impact for them. So it is an issue for the state, you know, and so therefore any direction in that path is not good for the state is my point. And we benefit tremendously from offshore production and, and the companies that are headquartered here, the service companies. Um, I, I, can you talk to us not about your revenue estimate? I, I don't want to uh, uh, leak anything there, but about potential looming cost drivers for the legislature. You've been really good about kind of getting 
long-term vision uh, front and center for them. And, and we also had a question come in on, on kind of the tech sector really modernizing a, a lot of oil and gas and, and, and reducing some of the um, uh, reducing jobs, but making companies more efficient and drilling platforms. Yeah, you know, more it's efficient. really interesting. I'm, I'm going to hit on that last one first, if you don't mind. It's really sure, interesting sure. that during this during this uh, COVID pandemic time and lower prices than oil, uh, it, it you know, oil and gas industry didn't see the shedding of jobs that we saw at the level of 15 and 16. Obviously, there were some. In any any job loss is significant impact or company that's not going to be able to continue to do business but it wasn't to the same level. One company mm-hmm. leaner. And a lot of that is bet- because of technology and capabilities. You know, it's really interesting how uh, certain industries because either have to or technology capabilities have gotten a lot more efficient. And, you know, I, not to get too far off, but I did a tour on manufacturing about four years ago. And the reason I wanted to do that, because everybody was talking about to some degree, oh, we don't want it in, te- we don't need it in the U.S. Is it really coming back? Well, the job growth has gone down in the last 20 years of 19%. Well, yes, it had, but the jobs that were being paid were as high or higher. And I'm just making that analogy to the oil and gas industry is my point is that even if it's fewer jobs, those jobs are well paid. I mean, it's in the top, the top percentile of uh, other than being the CEO of a company, it's the best wages that are out there from an industry perspective is my That's point, right. you know, and, and, and so continuing to highlight that sometimes it's not the number of jobs, but the jobs that are out there, the quality of jobs that they are. Uh, yeah. As to, as to mention some of the looming issues, obviously just continuing to make sure the commitments the legislature made on public education, that's, that's front and center for, for most of them. Uh, also trying to make sure we continue to keep our commitments to fund infrastructure whether it's roads, water infrastructure, because you know if you don't do that, you don't have economic development and continued growth. But some of the things that people don't think about that I continue to highlight to the legislature is our pension plans. Our pension plans are not to the level of New Jersey or, or mm-hmm. Chicago, but we don't wanna be in that position. And so the legislature has made some pretty good commitments here in the last several years, at least when it comes to teacher retirement, we need to get in a little bit better shape for, for the state employee, employee retirement, because, you know, in my opinion, you just don't want to keep kicking the can down the road. And those of you that may not know what that means, postpone it till another day. I said that in a speech one day and the lady comes and said, I didn't want to ask, but what does kick the can down the road? And I said, I'm sorry. It's a you soccer didn't term in, or something. You, yeah. didn't, you didn't grow up in rural Texas like I did. So uh, that just meant sweep it under the rug, postpone it. She goes, oh, maybe you should say those next time. So <laughs> so I usually do. But the point being is, you know, pension issues is one of them that, that, that we've got to continue to monitor and watch. Um, as we go here, here into the future, that that's the biggest one. Well, it, and so now I will ask you about your revenue estimate. Uh, does a change in the administration have an effect, or or maybe a word of caution that you'll include uh, to lawmakers? Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, is we ask about does the administration matter, and obviously the administration does matter. I mean, I think we've seen that over the course of the last several administrations as as what their what their executive orders are going to be and how they go about at least working with states on potential flexibility, whether it's been Medicaid issues here in the state of Texas as as a a waiver we've gotten for some flexibility and ability to do. And so, you know, those those things do matter. Um, They they matter significantly. And and, and so therefore, you know, that word of caution is just, is is the, does the state of Texas go from uh, having a, a mark on our back or an ally in the administration does make a significant difference you know hopefully should it it should not but the fact is it does and that just means you know we need to work harder at, at the congressional or the u.s senate level to try to counterbalance some of that yeah yeah we, we got one more question in uh, it's a minerals question in the last couple of years uh, interstate gas pipeline systems and plants have been selling for a fraction of their appraised value excuse me not minerals an appraisal question um and lawsuits have been filed to contest these appraisals. Uh, as an example, this individual recently purchased a gathering system uh, for a fraction of what it is on the rolls. The appraisers used a cost approach rather than a market approach. And, you know, there's such a high value for these uh, uh, systems remaining in place. And that could be the difference yeah. between yeah. shutting in or, or, or operating. So what can be done and, and can guidance from your office help to mitigate or, or lessen some of these inevitable appraisal disputes? 
Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I haven't had that direct one to me uh, from, from that particular issue. So, you know, that's not one that, that I've been aware of. I've, I've been aware of others, whether it ends up being, you know, major hotels or, or something in that scenario from, from a couple of the larger metropolitan areas, those, those have came up, but this one I hadn't. So, you know, let me, let me get back with my staff. That's good. I'm glad somebody brought it up. You know, what we try to do is make sure to provide that guidance uh, to, to all appraisal districts. We review them every other year for best practices. And, and so therefore trying to make sure the guidance of what the industry standard is out there, also what is the best practices. And so, you know, that's, that's really the direct, direct impact that we can have, but then also during legislative session as members are looking for, you know, the most cost, the most effective way to address some of these issues, you know, we usually end up providing quite a bit of uh, helpful hints, you know, obviously we, we're, we're, we don't lobby, we just help provide guidance and information to what they need in the questions and help them get there in a much more, uh, most more efficient manner for everybody. So, you know, if that's something that uh, members are looking at for next session, you know, we're able to provide that as well, hopefully. Well, Glenn, thank you for your time today and your insight. You have a phenomenal team over there from Lisa, Nikki, Tom, uh, and, and, and lots of others at the Comptroller's Office, and we appreciate the work you do and they all do for Texans. Uh, I, I ask you for some closing thoughts, but we also got one last question about a state income tax. So, I mean, just oh, knock that yeah, one well, out, out of the we'll, park. Uh, we'll, we'll close on thought on that one. That one ain't going to happen. So uh, legislature legislature's not going to pass. And even if they did, we as the voters would have to pass a constitutional amendment. You know, people ask me other states that actually have them. I mean, whether you go to the West Coast or the East Coast, the, the interesting thing is during a downturn in the market, uh, mostly their income is, is based on a lot of it is on higher income salaries and a lot of those are capital gains and those are just as volatile as other revenue streams. And so, you know, my point being, is you see other states, sometimes that volatility significantly impacts their revenue streams. And so you really don't gain anything mm -hmm. from, from a lack of volatility and, and, you know, not having an income tax is obviously a significant benefit for Texas from an economic development standpoint. So I, I just don't see that happening. And, uh, you know, lastly, I just say thanks for uh, what y'all do in the state of Texas. Thanks for having a good working relationship with us. And uh, thanks again for, for uh, loan, loaning his car so he can uh, be, be on our economic panel here next week. He's done that for me ever since I got in this office trying to get together with, with some economists on national issues, local issues, and individual uh, industry groups. He's done that with us for I think six years, this will be the sixth year. And that, that really is helpful for my team just to kind of bounce ideas off and make sure that, that we're looking at kind of the right path as we're putting together our revenue estimates. So uh, greatly appreciate you be joining us next week, Carr. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Great, appreciate it very much. Well, Thank perfect. you all again. And anything else, just always circle with us. All right, That's great. See you guys. Thank you so much. All right, y'all be good. Well, Comptroller Hager can be found on the web at glennhager.com and on social media platforms. I want to thank again Noble Royalties for being our sponsor today. We ask that you consider Noble Royalties as you consider your business needs for your family or company. If you are interested in sponsoring future events, we want to hear from you. The Spotlight on the Issues webinar series will be back the first week in December with Railroad Commissioner Wayne Christian on Thursday, December 3rd. And, it, it, and in fact, Noble Royalties is sponsoring that one too. So we want to thank them uh, again. Uh, thank you for joining us. Please be sure to fill out the exit survey so that we can make these events even better. Have a great day. Thank you.